Let me start by uh, presenting the cytometry and biomarkers UTEX who is organizing uh, the webinar. We are an open access core facility at the Pasteur Institute that uh, hosts projects from uh, Pasteur Institute and from collaborative academic and clinical um, collaborative institutions. Uh, we have currently about 300 users who work on 150 projects and we support these projects through <clears throat> trainings, through scientific collaborations and through service. Our um, core facility is specific by its choice of technologies, which are selected to allow for multimodal cell phenotyping and molecular profiling down to single cell level. More precisely, uh, when one comes to the CBUTEX in our six laboratories, one can treat, isolate and process the cells in our cell culture facility, which is equipped to uh, allow for controlled environment for your experiments, such as hypoxia or manipulation with um, infections or infectious or human samples. A number of tools are available, precisely 30 technologies that can allow that allow you to measure cell metabolism, to detect multiplex or low quantities of proteins, or also to quantitate uh, gene expression profiles down to single cell level. A panel of technologies is available for cell phenotyping and sorting, and our bioinformaticians proposed bioinformatic analysis of data that is tailored to each project. This specific support and organization has been chosen in order to allow for the development of biomarkers within our core facility. For a biomarker to be a good, a good biomarker, it has to allow us to accurately predict the response that, would, uh, that an individual will have to different kinds of simulation. In other words, it should allow us to be able to conclude how whether there will be a disease developed by this, in, this person after exposure to pathogens, whether there will be a protective immunity uh, mounted upon vaccination, and whether a therapeutic approach would have beneficial effect or there would be some adverse events. Various systems immunology, systems biology and systems vaccinology studies, as well as cancer research over the past years have shown that in order to uh, identify biomarkers which are applicable and which can be translated into medical practices, one has to perform studies at various levels. In other words, it's not sufficient to understand the genotypes within a population or of a given individual or know how its gene will be expressed, various genes will be expressed in a pathological state to be able to um, draw a conclusion about a valuable biomarker. Instead, one has to understand genotypes, one has to understand the gene expression levels and also functional aspects of uh, that can be measured in, uh, in a different patient or individual. In addition, uh, one has to keep in mind that genetic factors as well as our way of living and our daily exposure to microorganisms have a significant impact on all of the phenotypes that we could measure. And when, when we say measure, we mean measuring at the cellular level. So what we basically measure is the way that cell responds to a given perturbation that has come from its environment. And these measurements of cell can be performed in bulk on all of the cells that are extracted, let's say, from the blood of an individual or from uh, a given tissue. These measurements in bulk are very informative, but there are a number of cases and situations where bulk analysis will be extremely limiting. Let me highlight a couple of examples. Here we have a schematic representation of uh, limitations that bulk measuring here presented with the green dotted line would have in on the upper panel time course analysis. So if we perform a bulk analysis, then any specific modifications in gene expression over time of a given subpopulation will be masked. The same is true if we have an amplitude in the expression of genes different over time between different subpopulations, again, bulk measurements will not reveal these details. When we look at the endpoint assays, multimodal, bimodal behavior will be 
uh, invisible, and we will not be able to measure the presence of rare cells. A concrete example of a situation where it is really necessary to work at single cell level with a single cell resolution is tumor biology. If we look at the tumoral tissues, here a concrete information can be drawn only if, you can, if we can have a single cell analysis of genotypes and phenotypes of individual different cell types that could be found uh, in this specific tissue. So if we want to learn about uh, clonality of tumors, about uh, genotype to phenotype um, uh, li links within tumoral cells, immun, uh, immune cells, or other stromal and other cells that could be found in this environment, we need to measure at single cell level. And this is why it is not surprising that uh, single cell analysis over the past decade has lived through a real boom and become uh, 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 an un undoubtable fashion. There are tens of thousands of articles that one can find on the PubMed that are based on the analysis at single cell level. New books describing different approaches and technologies are coming out basically on a monthly basis. And also the general population shows more and more interest in single cell analysis. Now, it is important to measure at the single cell level, but if we do phenotype each individual cell, it means that we need to process thousands if not millions of cells, to obtain statistically relevant information. And in order to do that, we need to have high throughput tools, and we need to also have tools which will allow us for miniaturization, and thus for the decrease of the cost of the measurements that we are going to perform. And this has been achieved through microfluidic solutions. Later on today, there will be a talk by Charles Barou dedicated to different ways in which microfluidics support single cell analysis. So through measurements of thousands and millions of cells, we generate single cell omics data. In other words, very rich and complex amounts of data, which gives us, uh, give us an information about um, protein, lipids, metabolites, and other information that we can obtain and measure in one individual cell. When we think of single cell analysis, then we can analyze and measure its status. So it's um, activation status, uh, the metabolites that it secretes, uh, and other things which give us an information about how it functions in a given moment. We can also be interested in how this cell relates to other cells that come from the same lineage, or how it um, arrived to the activation status and the state in which we find it today. Whereas lineage and trajectory uh, and the questions related to that will be responded to only through uh, advanced computational tools and expert bioinformaticians, the exploration of other types of, of data will also depend on uh, advanced bioinformatics. And tomorrow in the afternoon, Sebastian Mella is going to cover uh, different chapters related to the analysis of uh, single cell transcriptomics data. In any case, both analysis of cell status, its lineage and trajectory, uh, give rise to uh, unprecedented uh, presented quantity of complex and interesting data, which are uh, explored in different types of uh, studies, starting from myobedical research to evolutionary genetics uh, or cell developmental studies. So I'm going to focus on different aspects and types of analysis that we can use to e uh, evaluate the state of the cell. Ideally, we would want to measure the entire proteome of each individual cell and have an information, quantitative information about the expression of around 10,000 proteins that we can find in each human cell. Unfortunately, measurements of single cell proteome and single cell metabolome currently depend on mass spectrometry, and this method still faces a number of challenges and limitations when providing an information at single cell level. The current uh, resolution is around 100 cells, and the limitations that the methods are facing is facing is preparation of samples, uh, the uh, resolution, the, the high proximity of signals and low content of targeted molecules. Nevertheless, there is an effort from the community to deal and cope with these problems, and there are first works coming out and showing that in the near future we will hopefully have the way of assessing the whole single cell proteome and the whole single cell metabolome. 
Meantime, we have to um, rely on the technologies which will allow us a targeted analysis and uh, a phenotyping of cells through a selected number of parameters. Of many technologies and approaches which are available, I would like to focus on flow cytometry, which has for many decades been the tool of choice and the only actually uh, tool available for assessing the phenotypes of many individual cells. These technologies and this approach have gone through major changes and evolution over the past years thanks to two uh, developments. One is development of new reag reagents and fluorophores, which allow us today to work with 44 different colors uh, in cell characterization. And the other major advantage was achieved through the technology development. The technologies that allow for conventional flow cytometric measurements have reached 30 parameters that could be used in parallel to a phenotype a cell. And the real break breakthrough in um, flow cytometry came through the development of spectral cytometry and the machines such as Aurora or ID7000. Um, spectral cytometry, in contrast to um, conventional cytometry, does not capture only a selected bands of the uh, light that is emitted by the fluorophore attached to the cell surface. Instead, the entire uh, emission spectrum for each of the fluorophores is captured and then translated into a sig signature of these given uh, fluorophores and as such then used for the analysis of multiplex data. Since we have a signature of each fluorophores, fluorophore, basically all of the available fluorophores could be used simultaneously. This very powerful and novel approaches now allow us to perform an in-depth phenotyping for very small sample volumes. As an example, now if you have as little as 100 microliters of human blood, this will be enough to assess, quantify and uh, characterize all major, major immune cell populations that are present there. Some nine years ago, uh, the cytometry did not have uh, this level of uh, uh, the dimensionality and uh, the development of mass cytometry came as a real uh, improvement in the multiplex analysis of cells. This technology um, uses antibodies labeled to metal isotopes instead of fluorophores to label the cells and then in the analysis of the presence of these antibodies on the cell surface or inside the cells uses time of flight measurements which are normally uh, characteristics for spectrometry. In any case, by using mass, mass cytometry, one could measure um, simultaneously over 40 parameters on the cell. And over the past 10 years, numerous studies have been published in many different scientific fields that take advantage of uh, these approaches. Let's say only in the field of, uh, um, of oncology, there are over 200 papers being published. All of these three types of technologies, so mass cytometry, conventional or spectral cytometry, have all uh, one common limitation, and this is the lack of spatial resolution and information about where the probes are situated within the cell or between the cells. This limitation has been overcome with the development of imaging flow cytometry, which merges the advantages of flow cytometry and uh, microscopy, and thanks to the uh, highly developed and sophisticated optics, allows to analyze the cells in flow in a way to attribute to each of the dots which represent the cells in a classical dot plot representation of flow cytometry. So each dot, it links with the image of a given cell throughout 10 different uh, colors and channels. This has opened a way of basically illimited types of measurements as we can follow cell uh, signal intensity, its distribution and changes of cells uh, over uh, in, in, uh, in the sample. We can measure uh, different um, processes such as cell signaling or internalization, cell-cell interactions and many more, which are highly relevant for numerous uh, application fields. Here I'm highlighting three examples. One is the measurement and quantification of uh, individual bacteria. 
The other one is uh, studying of what happens at the inter interface of two cells in immune synapses. And the third one allows for following of internalization of uh, Shigella by human cells. So when we compare all of these equipments, we can see that each one of them has uh, different advantages. For the time being, the conventional flow cytometry is the only one which will uh, robustly allow us to sort the cells of interest alive. The imaging cytometry is the only one that provides spatial information, although its multiplexing is really rather, rather low. And until recently, mass cytometry was the only one that allows for a significant dimensionality and multiplexing to be performed. Now, with the occurrence and development of spectral cytometry, it is likely that over the next years, it will replace uh, all of these, both of these approaches uh, in a long term, uh, in a long term way. In any case, uh, these technologies are powerful, but depend on high affinity antibodies. The instruments that they require are, are very costly, and the multiplexing is dependent on the available reagents. So until a couple of years ago, the technologies were those who blocked the multiplexing uh, capacity. And now spectral, for example, cytometry can theoretically go to 188 parameters in parallel, but the reagents are not yet there. When we study a uh, secretome at single cell level or a uh, single cell intracellular uh, protein content, then we rely basically exclusively on the assays which are based uh, on um, ELISA. And I would like to highlight only two. The first one is CIMOA coming from single molecule RAs, which is a digital ELISA based on beads uh, uh, to which the primary antibody is coupled, and then we have a classical sandwich ELISA. But what makes it specific and highly sensitive, so its sensitivity is basically down to um, uh, 30 or so molecules of each protein or about femtimolar. What makes it so sensitive it's, uh, is uh, it's used of a specific disk arrays. So when the reaction is mounted on each individual bead, then these beads are collected in a chip. And on the chip, there are over 200,000 small wells in which only one bead can be positioned. Since the signal at the end will come digitally from each of these wells, this dramatically increases the sensitivity. The second technology for single cell protein measurements uh, that I would like to highlight is isolite that is based on the use of single cell barcoded chips. And the workflow for this machine starts by still stimulating the cells in bulk. So we don't start at single cell level, but in bulk. And then we load uh, the stimulated cells onto the chip. And here they will be separated one per nano well. The chip is barcoded with 32 different antibodies, color coded. And when we leave the cell, uh, exposed to these antibodies, then we will have an information about the cytokines, 32 or more for each cell, that each cell is secreting upon this initial simulation in bulk. Whereas CIMOA is usually not uh, applied in single cell studies, but could be, and here there are three examples of where it is usually, uh, where, where it was concretely used for single cell analysis. And I uh, very much like this particular example showing that it was used for following up the reactivation uh, of HIV from reservoirs uh, with the sensitivity of detecting the virus through the P24 molecule in one out of 20,000 analyzed cells. So already the first day after the uh, reactivation, we can monitor the presence of the virus. So this technology is not always used at, uh, at single cell studies, but its advantage is that it could be used, it's highly sensitive, and we can develop homebrew assays for a specific targeted molecules that we want. On the other hand, isolite has been already uh, evaluated in many different single cell approaches, and the company proposes different types of panels that will allow us to look at single cell secretome or intracellular proton, which is highly uh, significant for studies of tumors. And actually the, the technology is highly used for tumor, uh, tumor research. Here are some of the examples of published papers. And you, later on during the summer, there is a new panel for measuring of cell metabolome, single cell metabolome that will be launched. 
So if you compare these two machines, we can see that CIMOA is highly sensitive, but lacks multiplexing, whereas Isolite allows for more multiplexing and has a higher throughput, but is much less sensitive. I did not go into the details, but I think it's worthwhile mentioning the only technology that allows for single cell Western blot to be done, which is called Milo. And the Milo system can be used, for example, for validation of the profiles that were found by single cell transcriptomics when we are not looking for high multiplexing capacity and we start by really low cell numbers as 200 initial cells that will be put on the chip are sufficient. Usually when one says uh, single cell omics, one immediately thinks of uh, RNA sequencing and uh, single cell transcriptomics. And this is uh, not without reason. It was actually through this kind of analysis that different um, studies, numerous studies in the field of immunology, uh, neurology, uh, tumor studies, and many others have benefited and obtained very useful characterizations of uh, uh, relevant cells in different contexts. So many, uh, uh, many approaches and technologies are available. And in the talk of uh, Valentina Libri that will follow uh, my talk, you will learn about different techniques, their advantages and limitations for the analysis of single cell transcriptome, genome and epigenome. <clears throat> So all of these technologies and approaches that we mentioned so far allow us to evaluate uh, the behavior of cell in the steady state and upon uh, a stimulation or a perturbation. Now, if we are looking about, uh, if we are looking for biomarkers, we need to translate this information into the information that is applicable in uh, biomedical studies and that can be used at the level of an organism. As I mentioned before, for this we need an integrated approach and we need to know about cellular DNA and uh, mutations, gene expression and then the cellular behavior. We also need to have an insight uh, in the cellular microenvironment at, as it may be decisive for the behavior and response of each cell. It is therefore not surprising that the community has been putting a lot of efforts in developing so-called multi-omic single cell approaches. And this is why uh, many new emerging techniques and approaches have been tested and uh, are being evaluated to study in parallel uh, different modalities that we mentioned until now. Multimodal single cell analysis has therefore been also elected as the method of the year in 2019 by Nature Methods. Now, when we say multiomics, it sounds really nice and fashionable, but we are actually talking about, in general, two different modalities that can be quantitated within the same cell simultaneously. There are some uh, essays to work uh, on triple single cell omics, but these are still uh, under development and not fully finalized. In the next talk, you are going to, to uh, hear about different multi-omics approaches that involve transcriptomics, whereas I'm going to focus on spatial proteomics. There are basically two different technologies that are available. One has derived from mass cytometers and is called imaging mass cytometry. It uses uh, metal tagged antibodies to stain by conventional protocols uh, tissue slices. And these slices are then put in the machine where they will be um, um, exposed to a laser, a laser dissection of small spots of tissues. Once these small spots of tissues are taken away, they follow the usual uh, process of measure by measurements by time of flight. At the end, we will have an image reconstituted with the granularity of one uh, micron square in which different um, dyes can be followed, different dyes, different antibodies which were metal tagged. So the um, multiplexing of this approach now has the limitation of 30 dyes at a time. This is a very recent example of application of this technology in studies of uh, um, cellular landscape in breast cancer sections. The sections were stained with 35 uh, markers, and here we can see the complexity of the information and the images that we can obtain after uh, using imaging mass cytometry. 
And more recent technology that was uh, that became available one and a uh, half year ago is Codex, which relies on uh, fluorescence measurements and uh, in which the workflow starts with single staining, single step staining of tissue sections by a panel of antibodies. These antibodies are coded by specific oligo uh, nucleotides, and there are by, by now over 50 different combinations of uh, oligonucleotides that can be used. After this initial step of staining, we will add reporters, three reporters at a time that bear fluorescent uh, labels, and that will um, be labeled to three, uh, that will attach to three of those antibodies. Once they are labeled, we can use any uh, conventional fluorescent microscope to reveal the images. Then these three reporters will be, uh, will be taken away, will be removed, and then the cycle will be repeated for 10 or more iterations. At the end, there will be a complex image of 30 and more parameters that can be stained within the same uh, section of the tissue. Here I'm showing, sharing with you the results of Gary Nolan's lab, which were published two years ago, and in which the technology has been uh, validated and uh, evaluated. That, and the, the results are really promising, showing that the sensitivity is the same or even higher of that of the mass cytometry, and that the complexity of the phenotypes has, uh, that can be measured is really high with, um, uh, with a significant resolution. So both Codex and Hyperion are the unique technologies in a way that they can allow us to follow high throughput protein um, signatures in tissues and tumors. For the time being, the multiplexing is rather limiting, but for Codex, the multiplexing capacity is uh, increasing fast, and hopefully in the near future, we will go even beyond uh, the announced 40 or 50 parameters. So we saw that we can measure different types of information and phenotypes within a single cell, either uh, at the steady state or uh, upon immune uh, or upon its perturbation, but the missing link is fun functional studies at single cell level. In order to obtain functional measurements, uh, what one needs to do would be to first uh, isolate individual cells of interest, then expose them to selected stimuli, measure their specific response, and then recover them to continue with the analysis. So far, only two technologies have tried to tackle uh, this problem and this uh, question. The first uh, one that came out a couple of years ago is Polaris from Fluidine, that bases its analysis on um, integrated fluidic circuits, which are the specificity of the company. And here is just one image of a micro microphage uh, uh, positioned within a well of uh, this kind of a chip. Through this technology, one can recuperate, uh, select, by fluorescence 48 cells, leave them on the chip and expose them to different stimuli for one day, and then recuperate single cell cDNA. At the beginning of this year, another technology became available in Europe, like lightning from Berkeley uh, Lights, uh, which, is, um, which is based on the usage of light in positioning the cell throughout the chip, it allows to simultaneously analyze 1,500 cells, also by fluorescence. Uh, here, one can follow the cells of interest or during several days on chip and recuperate, which is really unique feature, living cells at the end. There will be a talk by John Kudolo tomorrow uh, at two o'clock dedicated to different applications and uh, advantages of this technology. So from what was discussed until now, we can see that the single cell omics is the technology that is extremely powerful, sensitive, and that has a high resolution. It's high throughput and mixed multiplexing capacities made it indispensable for different types of analysis. It produces rich data and luckily it's re rapidly evolving because the cost over the time is decreasing and with time also we have more and more sophisticated and powerful tools. On the other hand, the list of challenges is still long. 
especially in terms of cell preparation and the quantity of uh, targeted molecules that we are dealing with at the single cell level, especially when we look at single cell proteome or metabolome, there is still a number of measurements which um, are, can only be measured as targeted and not uh, as a full information at the level of the cell. Multimodal analysis has started, but it's not yet fully accomplished. And the data are extremely rich, but being rich and complex, they also face a number of challenges, including standardization and dealing with the complexity and sparsity of data. And finally, uh, the most maybe challenging uh, issue is related with the analysis of individual microbes, because this question has not really been tackled uh, by a commercial solution so far. I would like to uh, finish by mentioning one very interesting initiative, which is called Human Cell Atlas, which started in 2016 uh, by Aviv Regev and Sarah Teichman, which has a mission to create a comprehensive map of all human cells with the goal of providing understanding of human health and serving as basis for diagnosis, monitoring and treating different diseases. Numerous countries and institutions have been involved in this initiative and it has already started by numerous pilot projects in different types of, um, um, of tissues, organs and also diseases. With this, I thank you for your attention and we'll look at your questions and we'll also be happy to take some more questions.